Right, uh, good morning to all of you again. Uh, we will continue to uh, study James' epistle. Someone asked me this morning whether this is the last. Um, not yet. So we are at chapter 5. And this morning we are going to look at uh, verses 16 through 18. Right? James chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. But let me read from verse 13. Right? Read from verse 13 in the sense of verse 13 through verse 18 form a unit. But in this one unit, I think you can kind of break up into different sections. So the way I have done it is to look at uh, verse 13 uh, last week. Okay, James chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sin to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. All right, uh, I'm going to focus on verses 16 through uh, 18 of this uh, chapter. And I have taken the title actually from the from verse sixteen, right? From the from the ESV uh, version, right? And the title this morning is "Prayer Has Power," right? Prayer has power. So this text, obviously, as you can see, is about prayer. This whole section right, is about prayer. You can see the word prayer mentioned repeatedly in this passage. In verse 13, you see, you know, in uh, verse 14 and, and so on, right? The word prayer is mentioned uh, repeatedly in this text. And we know that James is uh, very uh, concerned about this subject, right? He actually talks about prayer a lot, even in this letter. You might remember what he said in the, in the very first chapter. If anyone lacks wisdom, he says, let him ask of God. And then in chapter 4, remember, it says uh, there are people who pray, but they did not receive. Why? Because they pray wrongly. So he's concerned about the subject of prayer. But in this section, as he touches on the subject of prayer, now we want to ask the question, now what does James want to tell us about prayer? Uh, Do you tell people about prayer? Do you talk with your friends in the church about prayer? Do you mention prayer to your friends? And if you talk about prayer to your friends, or as parents, do you talk about prayers with your children? Do you perhaps try to encourage them to pray? Or do you teach them to pray? Or do you talk about prayer? Now that, that is the point here. Right? Do you talk about prayer to your friends in church, to your family members? To your children? If not, why not? See, James talked about prayer, and here I want to point out at the very beginning that the reason he wants to talk about prayer is because he believes in prayer. Perhaps we don't believe in prayer because we do not see anything special about prayer. Perhaps we ourselves don't think a lot about prayer. And maybe... We don't even pray much. So James talks about prayer. And the particular thing he wants to tell us about prayer is this. Is that prayer has power. He wants to impress upon us this point. 
Prayer has power. Look at verse 16 again. He says, Therefore confess your sin to one another and pray for one another and he will, and pray for one another that you may be healed. Then he said, The prayer of a righteous person has great power. I think that is the, the point he's trying to make in this whole section here. Prayer has great power. And this morning you see that I'm using the ESV rather than my usual NKJV. And the reason is because I believe that here, I, can, I see that here, that the ESV help us understand uh, exactly what James is trying to say in the NKJV. Uh, I think it's translated as the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails. Or in the old King James, it's availed much. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availed much. But you probably cannot make, you know, immediately get what the NKJV or KJV is saying. But here in the ESV, it is very plain. James says, I am telling you about prayer because prayer has Power. Okay, that is our subject this morning. I want to ask you, does your prayer has power? Does your prayer has power? Is your prayer powerful? If not, why not? What kind of prayer, right, is powerful? Maybe you can think of some people's prayer. Is, oh, that person's prayer is powerful. But why? Why? And what makes a person's prayer powerful and yours is not? Alright, so let's explore this subject. Prayer has power. And the first thing I want to uh, expand on is this. What kind of prayer is powerful? Right. I think that's what James wants to have us see. Prayer is powerful, but not all kind. All right? Because he already mentioned in chapter 4, Though there are some who pray, but not effective. No power. God doesn't answer. Right? So, what kind of prayer is powerful? Now, as James here talks about the power of prayer and try to help us understand the kind of prayer that is powerful, now, there are two things he wants us to see about powerful prayer. Two things he wants us to see about powerful prayer. So, if you want your prayer to have power, you have to see these two things that James is pointing out here. Number one, all right, number one, you see that in verse 16 again, all right, verse 16. He says, the prayer of a righteous person has great power. Now, that, that, that is a line that we want to spend time this morning meditating on because th that is the key, right? That is his main point here. The prayer of a righteous man has great power. If you understand that, then you understand where that power comes from. So first, I say two things here in this line. The first thing is this. He talks about the prayer. All right, the prayer. Now, what does James mean here? So the first thing he says is that there is a certain kind of prayer. So that's what he means with this word, prayer. You see, the New King James translation, as I quoted just now, translate it this way. All right. It says the effectual fervent prayer. And so there is an adjective there. All right. There's a word that modify the word prayer. And that is really what James is trying to get at when he uses this word prayer. Because the word prayer in the Bible, because there's a number of words, in fact, there are two main words translated as prayer in the English. But the word that James uses here is a unique, a special word, a very distinctive word, not the common word that is used elsewhere translated as prayer. And so the word that James uses here, right, it, it is, is implied in that word, right? That the meaning of that word, right, is this. It is a word that, that speaks of someone wanting to bring a matter, let's say, to the king. In fact, that is the word, right? When someone up seeks an audience with the king because he has some important matter right, to bring to the king's attention. Now, this is the same word used. And so James employs that word to speak of prayer here. 
the kind of prayer that is effective. So what is James saying by using that word? He says, this is the kind of prayer that is effective or that is powerful. It is the prayer like one saying something like this. I must bring this to the attention of the king. Now that is what that word prayer here means. Someone who sees that there is an important matter that needs to be brought to the attention of someone important and powerful enough to address the issue. So that is the word here. And, and for that reason, other translation as the word earnest or fervent. So it is not just prayer, but it is the earnestness. It's something that people see about, their, about this prayer, this request that you have to bring this matter to the attention of someone who can address the issue. So when they say, I must bring this to the attention of the king, or among children, sometimes you see a child say, no, I must tell daddy. Right? Others will not do. Must tell daddy, must bring this to daddy's attention. Maybe a broken you know, jar or a tap that is not working. Nobody else can solve this problem. Right? Only daddy can solve the problem. Now, that is the sense. So there is a sense of desperation. There is a sense of urgency that is implied in this word. There is a sense of the importance of this matter. Now, does this reflect your prayer? Does this reflect your prayer when you pray? Is that the sense that now there is something important that I must bring to someone who is powerful and able to, to address the issue? Now that is what James is talking about. So James therefore says that the prayer that is powerful, this prayer, he's saying, is of a certain kind. Not all prayers are powerful. Not all prayers have power. Maybe we can say that most prayers are not powerful. That, dare we say that? No. Very often, I, I think about this matter. I think about people gathered in, together for prayer meetings. We, I think about people who pray in their own prayer lives. And I think about myself as I pray. Do our prayers have this kind of power that James speaks about? Now, what kind of prayer has no power? Now, Jesus mentions that. Now, turn with me for a while to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And look at verse 5. Matthew 6 and verse 5. Listen to what Jesus says here. He says, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogue and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. What Jesus says is that this kind of prayer has no value. These are hypocritical prayers. These are people who pretend to pray. If you are pretending to pray, if you attend a prayer meeting just in order to impress other people that you say, I attended a prayer meeting. If you pray in order to show off to other people, and that's what Jesus is talking about here of the Pharisees. You hypocrite. You pray. Only because you want people to know that you are a person who, who is pious, who is religious. Now once I was speaking to a friend. He was speaking about his pastor. And he says that you know his pastor told him not to disturb him. From 10 a.m. right to 11 a.m. Because he would be praying. It's well known, right? The whole, everybody knows that. Huh? Don't disturb me, right? because I'm a man of prayer. Between this time and that time, every day, I will be praying. You don't have to let anybody know. That's what Jesus is saying. You just want to impress. Or in verse 7, same chapter, Matthew 6, in verse 7. And when you pray, Jesus says, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. This kind of prayer is useless. The KJV or NKJV translate as vain repetition. So for a lot of prayer, a lot of people, their prayers are simply vain repetition. Mumbling, mechanical, not from the heart. 
It's just many words. But these are empty words. Now that's what this translation, empty phrases that are of no use. It cannot rise up even above the ceiling. You see, in the Bible, again and again, we see that whether it's Jesus or whether it's James, that there are such a thing as prayer that is not effective. So what kind of prayer is powerful? What, what does James has in mind here when he says the prayer of a righteous man has powerful or has power, has great power? What kind of prayer? Now, thank God that we have many examples of such a kind of prayer in the Bible. Turn with me to Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 1. When I was preparing to lead uh, our men's prayer meeting the last time. Now this thought came to my mind. Right? This thought came to my mind as I think of Jeremiah and Nehemiah. And I think of many other people in the Bible and their prayer. Now this is one thing that I observe. Now in verse 1, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, now it happened in the month of Chiflech, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that, the, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who has survived the exile, is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. Now you see this information as the information arrives and uh, as Nehemiah listened to this information, his heart was moved. You see, that is what James is talking about. You see, our heart must be moved by the things that we pray about. Not just mumbling, not just, you know, vain repetition, not just merely just mention them. But you see, we are told that these things, these informations move Nehemiah. And then we are told in verse 4, As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And the thing that I noticed in Nehemiah's prayer is that he was weeping. When you read of the story of Hannah in 1 Samuel, we are told that she wept. Now you see, when we read of the king Hezekiah in 2 King, when he realized his trouble, we are told that he wept before the Lord. Where is the tears? Where are the tears? Where is the weeping in our prayer? How often do we break down as we pray about certain matters? So gripped by the, these matters, so concerned about the welfare of God's people, or of a certain individual, that it moved us to tears before the Lord. I believe that that is what James is thinking about. And that's the reason why the other translation adds the word fervent. And it's not just prayer. So the idea of this word prayer includes that intensity. The intensity of the person who prays. That pouring out of the heart and of the soul before the Lord. In fact, that is how the Bible describes Hannah's prayer. She, she poured out her soul before the Lord. When was the last time you poured out your soul before the Lord? When was the last time that you actually shed tears as you pray for certain individuals or about certain matters? No wonder there is no power in our prayers because we never cry. We never wept, we never weep. We are never moved the way that these people were moved by the things that they prayed for. 
Now that is what James is talking about. That is the kind of prayer that is powerful. The prayer, James says, of a righteous man has great power. The fervent prayer. Now to confirm that that is in James's mind, that he has in mind the, in, the kind of prayer, the intensity of that prayer, the fervency of that prayer, the earnestness of that prayer, is to just read the following verse, right, in James 5. In verse 17, in verse 17, he says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently. So that is what he is talking about. So he refers to Elijah. Here's a man whose prayer has great power. Why? Because he prayed fervently. And you see, Paul uses, you no. Know, terms like that to describe his own prayer. And as he urges pray, people to pray with him, what does he tell people to do? Does he simply say, pray with me? No. He said, strive together with me in prayer. Romans 13. He says, be devoted. He said, pray earnestly. To strive is to agonize. Say, agonize with me in prayer. So the intensity now, I see there's a certain kind of prayer that works, that is powerful, that, has, that produces result. No wonder so many pray, people's prayers are not producing result. Who do you blame? Us. Ourselves. We have not poured out our heart to the Lord. So, prayer has power, but only certain kind of prayer. So, the first thing. Then the second thing James mentioned about the prayer that has power is this. Again in James 5 and verse 16. Look at that line again. He says, the prayer of a righteous person. So the next word to take note of is the word righteous. It is not only the kind of prayer, but also the kind of person who prays. So what kind of person? What kind of person's prayer is powerful. James says, a righteous person. Are you a righteous person? Now, of course, that again, let's just do that question. So what does that mean to be righteous? Or what does James mean here when he says a righteous person? Now, you better get to know that because James said, if you are not a righteous person, your prayer has no power. So we need to know what that means. And see whether we are the person that James is talking about here. Righteous. So what does righteous mean? What does righteous mean? I think it, it means in two, you know, there are two senses, right? There are two things that James have in mind here when they speak of a righteous man or righteous person. The first is this. Now turn with me to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2. Let me read beginning in verse 6. 1 Peter, uh, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 6. If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. Now if he rescued righteous Lord, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked. For as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment from the day of judgment. So can you see these two words here? Righteous and unrighteous. Godly and ungodly throughout this passage here in 2 Peter. Now I think that is what James means when he thinks of a righteous man. And here Peter calls Lot a righteous man. Why is Lot called a righteous man? Why is Lot called a righteous man? Because if you read the Old Testament, you don't get the impression that he was a righteous man. 
He is a righteous man as opposed to all the others in Sodom who were unrighteous or ungodly. Now, the first sense of what righteousness means is this, that a righteous man is a Christian. A righteous man is someone who has been made right with God. Are you right with God? Now, that is the first thing. Are you right with God? Are you a Christian man, a Christian woman? Are you a child of God? Now, you see, if you are not a child of God, your prayer has no effect. You get it? If you are not a Christian, your prayer has no power. Listen to what is written here in the Gospel of John, chapter 9. John chapter 9 and verse 31. John 9 and verse 31. We know that God does not listen to sinners. We know that God does not listen to sinners. God does not listen to people who are not His. Now, see, that is what James means. So, if you are not a righteous man, if you are not a Christian, if you are not a child of God, your prayer has no meaning. You must be a child of God. You must be made right with God. That is the only way to be righteous. You must be made right with God through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, that is the only way we may be made right with God. You can only be made right with God through faith in Jesus Christ. So if you are a righteous man, right? if you are Lord, right? if you are a Christian man, now that is the first thing about what you need to be in order for your prayer to have power. But there is a second thing. All right, there is a second thing about being a righteous man. Not only you must be a Christian man, you must be a child of God. But also, but also, First John, right? Turn with me to First John, chapter three. First John, chapter three, verses seven and eight. First John, chapter three, verses seven and eight. Verse seven. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Who is a righteous man? First of all, he must be made right with God. But secondly, as John tells us here, he must practice righteousness. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Verse 8. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. So if you are living in habitual sin, if you are living a life of sin, now that only shows that you are of the devil, you are not of God. You see, John, John makes it plain in his letter. You know why he wrote this letter, First John? What was the reason that he wrote First John? Now the reason is this. In fact, he tells us right in the in, in, in chapter five. John has the habit of telling us the reason why he writes. Right? When he wrote the gospel, he told us the reason. In John chapter 20 and verse 31. When he writes his epistle or his letter, he also tells us the reason why he writes his letter. So what is the reason? Chapter 5. Alright, chapter 5 and verse 13. He writes, I write these things. Now, this is the reason. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. In other words, he said, I write this letter in order to have you know and gain the assurance that you are indeed a true child of God, that you indeed have eternal life. There are people who think that they are believers, but they are not. There are people who think that they have eternal life and that they are going to heaven, but they are not. 
You see, it is possible to think that you are one, but you are not. And so John wrote this letter to explain to them how to know whether you are a true child of God, whether you are a true believer. And one of the marks, one of the ways you can tell whether you are a true child of God or not is your life. Are you living a life of sin? Are you living a life of sin? And maybe some of you are thinking, I'm not, I'm not living a life of sin because I'm not a terrorist. I'm not a rapist. I'm not a bank robber. I don't do all those things. So I'm not a sinner. So John clarifies. You know what does it mean to sin? You know what it means to sin against God? 1 John chapter 3. Alright, 1 John chapter 3. Now listen to John here. Alright. Verse 4. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practice lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. And what does John mean when he says sin is lawlessness? In the other translation, the other version, he says sin is the breaking of the law of God. Sin is the breaking of the law of God. God has demands upon us. God has clearly told us what and how we ought to live our life. God told us that there are things that we cannot do. God has also told us that there are things that we must do. So have you sinned against God? Are you living a life of sins? Or are you living a life of disobedience to the clear teaching of His Word? Now that is what John is talking about. What kind of life are you living? What kind of life are you living? Do you know His Word? Do you know His will? Are you even eager to know His will? If you are not eager, then you are not eager to follow his laws, then you are a rebel, then you are a sinner. That characterizes your life, a life that is not according to the word of God. That's what John is talking about. So righteousness, on the one hand, it means that you must be a Christian. You must have been made right with God. But righteousness, as John clarifies here, means that we practice righteousness. We live a life of obedience to God. We live a life of obedience to God. Now you flip over to the Old Testament illustration, example of this. In Joshua chapter 7. Jo Joshua chapter 7. Now here is an account that makes this point amply clear. Joshua chapter 7. First look at verse 6. Joshua chapter 7 and verse 6. Here we are told that Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening he and the elders of Israel and they put on dust on their heads. So they have realized that a great sin has been commanded and been committed by the people of God. And so they are here in prayer as they were. They tore their clothes. They want to come together and plead for mercy. So what did God do? What did God say to Joshua? Verse 10. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Get up! Why have you fallen on your face? In other words, as Joshua gathered these people in a prayer meeting, as he would, and God is saying, Forget about the prayer meeting. Get up! Why are you all gathered for prayer? Why are you all as if you look so pious? You see, it is possible for people to have a kind of religion, looking very pious, participating in all the religious activity. And God will say to these people, stand up, get lost. You know how many times God did that to the people of Israel? You go back and read Isaiah chapter 1. And God said the same thing to these people. All these things that you're bringing before me, all your show of piety, he say, I will have none of those. You see, we never thought, we never thought in our life that God would ever say a thing like that to us. They said, don't come to church. What for? What for? See, this is what God said to Joshua. 
So God, the Lord said to Joshua, Get up, why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. So God says, don't do this thing. And therefore the people, verse 12, of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their back before their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. God says there's no point trying to do all this religious activity when in your life you're not living a life of obedience. You're not really interested to do what I tell you to do. Because from your action, it shows that you are doing exactly the things that I told you not to do. You see, this inconsistency, and that's what James is talking about. That's what James is talking about. The prayer or the fervent, intense, earnest prayer of a righteous man, of a Christian, but not just a Christian. That's the reason why the psalmist says, in Psalms 66, the Lord said, well, the psalmist says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If you nurture, you know, if you have this besetting sin in your life and you love this sin, you will not give up this sin. And then you expect your prayer to be heard. The Bible says, forget about it. Forget about it. We cannot pray effectively if we live defectively. This, there must be this consistency. And it matters. That's what James is talking about. It matters how you live your life. Alright, so that is the first thing James is saying here, right? He says that the prayer of a righteous man has great power, right? Now, so the, there's the second part, right? We're going to look at the prayer of the righteous man. And then we ask, what happens when a righteous man pray fervently? What happens when a righteous man pray fervently? James says, right? He has great power. If a righteous man prays fervently, it has great power. How do we know? What does, just mean, what does James mean here with this? He has great power. In what sense is that great power? Now it's in the word, right? In the ESV translation, James continued, said the prayer of a righteous man has great power, then he says, as it is working. As it is working. What does James mean here when he say has great power as it is working? In fact, I struggle with that phrase and say, what does James mean? So I look at the other translation and the King James translation translates as as avail, or avails or avails. What does this avail or working means? Now, I think it means this. What James is it has great power because, I think there's a meaning of as it is working, because it works. It has great power in the sense of because or since, I think it means because, it works. The word works, translated in the King James Version, is effectual. Or effective. In other words, he has great power because it is effective. That is what James is talking about here. It is effective. Now, is it is effective in the same sense that it is effective, right? In First Thessalonians chapter two, right? Look at First Thessalonians chapter two and verse thirteen. The same word is employed there by Paul. So Paul uses the same word translated as working or avails, or sometimes translated as prevail or effective. Right? So these are the various English translations for that word. Avails, prevails, effective, or works. So that is the same word that James, uh, Paul employs when he wrote to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and uh, verse 13. Verse 13. Paul writes, And we also thank God 
constantly for this, that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you who believes, or in you believers, which is at work. The word work is the same right, word that James uses in James 5. So in the ESV, it kept translating at works. Other translation, effective or prevails. Now, you see, what James therefore means is this, that he uses this word, right, that is almost always used to describe God at work. So it's a word that used to refer to God working, God at work. So when Paul uses that word, he says that when we preach the word of God, you receive it. This word has such power in your life. This word, this word of God is effective. It transforms you. Why? So Paul was giving an explanation as why it happened. He said it is because when the word of God is being preached to you, you receive it as, not as from me, but as the word of God. Why? Because it is God who works effectively in you. The Spirit of God works in your heart powerfully to challenge you, to make you understand and to transform you. It is God working when the preacher preaches, but God is working. That is the word. And so James employs the same word. He said, when we preach, God is at work. And when we pray, who is at work? God is at work. Can you not see? That's the reason why Paul believes in preaching. Preach the word, he tells Timothy. Be instant, in season, out of season. Oh, there'll be people who are not interested in the word, but you preach. This is the only way to change people's heart. That is the only way people may be transformed. Preach the word. Because when you preach the word, God is at work. God will break down hard hearts. God will change them. God will transform them. And you know what? When you pray, God is at work. There may be a friend of yours, or a relative, or your child, and you have been praying and praying and praying. But believe in this, James says. Prayer is powerful. Why? Because when you pray, God is at work. God will change that child. God will change your friend. God will change your loved ones. That's why prayer is powerful. That's what James is talking about. Prayer has great power. The prayer of a righteous man has great power. Why? Because it works. Who works? God is at work when you pray. Do you believe that? The Bible has many examples of this. When men pray, God opened the sea. When men pray, God shut the lion's mouth, quench the flame of fire, open prison doors, soften hardened hearts. What has prayer not done? What has prayer not done? Or what has God not done through the prayers of men and women who dare and who believe in prayer? Now that is what James is talking about. He says, I want to talk to you about prayer. And I want to tell you that prayer has power. Because when you pray, God is working. And then he closes, right? He closes by giving us a, an example to illustrate, right? An example to illustrate. Back to James chapter 5. James chapter 5, in verse 17. And he says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. So he ends, he has this point here, then he says, let me give you an example to prove my point. The example of Elijah. So he brings up Elijah to prove his point. Now he wants us to see two things about Elijah here. Now two things about Elijah to help us, to encourage us. 
He doesn't bring in Elijah. Now, sometimes he says, Oh, I want to encourage you to pray. I want to tell you that prayer has great power. I want to tell you that when you pray, God is at work. I want to tell you that prayer changes things. Believe in prayer. Then you bring Spurgeon. Oh, he Oh, Spurgeon. Too big an example for me. Or oh, Josh Mueller. Oh, Josh Mueller is a great man of faith. I'm not. I'm not a Spurgeon. I'm not Josh Mueller. I'm not all these people. Well, so why does James bring up Elijah? It's for these two reasons. Number one, he brings up Elijah to point to us, or to show to us that Elijah is just a man like us. <laughs> He's just like us. He is a man like us. And so this first thing he tells us about Elijah, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Elijah, he says, was not a superman. Elijah was not a super Christian. Now we like to think all these super, you know, super men, you know, super women, all these, oh, they are men of God, men of faith. You know, oh, they are different. You know, we, 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 are not, we are not super. We are all the little mini Christian, you know, walking around. Oh, we've got no power. We have no power. You see, sometimes I visit uh, people's home and people have that tendency to call, to, tell, to, to request, all right? I say, hey, Pastor, uh, can you pray for us? So just thinking, why haven't you been praying right, for yourself, all right? Or for, can you please pray for my child or for my children? So why haven't you been praying for your children? I think there is this idea that the pastor's prayer has power, right? It's a power prayer, right? So pastor better pray. Why? Because pastor, right? Now, you see, we have that kind of mentality. It's a super mentality, right? And so, James wants to debunk, right? That kind of mentality. Oh, no, no, no. Elijah, common man. Pastor, he's just one of us. Right? His prayer is not more powerful than your prayers. So once you have the idea, you know, some people's prayers are more powerful, I think you've got a wrong idea. So that's what James is saying. No. Yes, he was a prophet, but he was not perfect. Yes, he is a man of great faith, but remember, he also ran for his life, right? Yes, he was a man of great courage, but remember, he was discouraged as well. We read of Elijah. What do you know about Elijah? Very, for a lot of people, he's more known for his despair and depression and dis discouragement. Well, that was Elijah, and that's the reason why he used the word. Now, that is the same word that is used in Acts, right? If you turn with me to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14, that Elijah, uh, that, you know, of like nature. Yeah. Acts chapter 14 and uh, verse 15. Now here's Paul, right, saying, Men, why are you do the, doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you. And we bring you good news. No, you see what Paul is saying here? Paul is saying to these people, why you treat me like this way? I'm just like you. The great apostle Paul. He tells these people, say, I'm just a man of like nature. A man like you. And you know that Paul was a great man. And Paul Washer was a great man. He's a great man, right? But he would, he would, tell you, right, that he is a man like us. A man like us. And secondly, secondly, James tells us that Elijah, I bring an example because he is just like one of us. He has his moments of discouragement, despair, fear. But, secondly, with supernatural power. A man with a nature like ours, but with supernatural power. Right? That's what he says uh, following right, in, the, in verse 17 here. That when he prayed fervently that it might not rain, that it did not rain for three and a half years. Then he prayed again and the rain came. Power. Prayer has power. The prayer of a man like us has power. That's what he's saying. And so he's saying to you this morning, your prayer 
can have power. Can have power. If you are a righteous man, and if you pray fervently, right? if you are a righteous man, and you pray fervently, your prayer has power. And so what James is doing here is that he gives us an example of an ordinary man with extraordinary power. An ordinary man with extraordinary power. So what explains that? What explains that? An ordinary man with extraordinary power. Well, James tells us here that he prayed fervently. He prayed fervently. And his prayer remains a living example of the kind of prayer that works. Right? His prayer is a living example of the kind of prayer that works. Now, in my study of this text, actually, I was very encouraged. That is how it impacted me. Because as I meditated on this text, now I realized that there are many big and even impossible things that I want to see happen. There are many big and maybe impossible things that I want to see happen. I want to see salvation. There are people that I'm reaching out to. There are people that I am praying about who are not saved today. But I want them saved. But this is a big thing. Because I know from my theology that they are dead in their trespasses and sin. That nothing, nothing can change them except by the grace of God, except if God works in their life through prayer. I want to see spiritual growth in the life of believers. I pray constantly for people in the church. I notice them from the start. Their spirituality or lack of spirituality. But I want to pray and I pray that they might grow in the spiritual life and become more fervent. That they become people who truly love the Lord Jesus Christ, who give themselves more to the work of the gospel. Again, this is a big thing to pray for. It's not easy for people to change spiritually. But I'm encouraged because James says, prayer has great power. When you pray, God is at work. God is at work in these people's lives. Sometimes one will pray for relief from suffering for people. But you see, as I think and think of the things that I want to see happen, I am encouraged by what James is saying here, that when I pray, God works. And that is a promise. That is a promise. If you pray, God works through your prayer, to bring about great effect in the life of people, in the life of the church, and in your own life, in the life of your family. Do you have things? Do you have things that you want to see happen? And have you prayed? Have you prayed? Let us pray. Our dear Father in heaven, we want to thank you again for this instruction that James has written here in his letter to help us see and understand indeed prayer is your the means that you have ordained that you might change the world. Lord, we therefore pray that we might indeed understand and know of this great blessing and great privilege and help us all to indeed believe in prayer and be men and women of prayer. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.